looks a little bit like the video game SimCity from up there. Any of you played that game? That was one of the first video games I remember playing. And we had that on our workstation computers back there at Tonopah Test Range in Nevada. That would be unheard of on Air Force computers nowadays, but back then it was a different time. Our station chiefs had a Tetris competition going. Base operations brought over a copy of Civ. And yeah, we had that early gaming culture going at work. Different time. Anyway, those are just old memories. Let's check out what's happening this evening. And there in the distance to the south, you can see anvils way out there, probably almost 100 miles. Those are thunderstorm anvils in the Houston area. And those are heading north towards College Station, east of Waco, and maybe even Tyler. That's very common during the summer months, especially in June. And it produces a little bit of shower activity around here in the early evening. And there's a look at the weather picture for this afternoon. We have definitely slipped into summer. I'm seeing 80s and 90s all over the map. Except for the northeast where we've had a little inrush of cold air at the usual places up there in New York, Pennsylvania, Michigan. So the temperatures, well, we're not getting 40s and 50s like a few weeks ago, but we are getting 70s and some very cloudy weather. And the leading edge of the front is down there in the Ohio River Valley. And then we've got tropical air covering the entire Great Plains, all the way from Texas up to North Dakota. Pretty much 80s all the way up through there in 90s down along the Gulf Coast. And there's, you can see that uh, sea breeze moving north, running from about Victoria up to the woodlands and maybe up towards the Lufkin area. And then we go out into the southeast U.S. and we've got much more numerous storms. Looks like one good complex over the Boston Mountains of Arkansas and then just numerous cells across the southeast and a kind of a congregated line there around Jackson, Mississippi into the Alexandria, Louisiana area. Also some pretty well-developed storms on the high plains around Cheyenne. Scott's Bluff there getting some outflow winds. And then we are starting to see the appearance of the dry line on the Great Plains, pretty much from the Cap Rock up towards around, uh, let's see, around Grand Island. No, not Grand Island. Uh, North Platte. And some modest 40s and 50s dew points to the west of there. You can see there's not much of a westward push except around northeast Colorado. So with that kind of parallel flow along the dry line, you're not going to really firm up that contrast. And you can see it looks very summer-like. And in the summer, we do tend to get a lot of storms going up around Lubbock, Amarillo. They tend to be disorganized and high-based, but they're there. In the southwestern U.S., very hot. We've got 111 there. Forgot what station that is. That's north of Yuma. And the San Joaquin Valley, very hot. 97 up there near Red Bluff, 96 east of Sacramento, 98 at Fresno. So the blast furnace is in full effect. Up in the northwest U.S., we got another cold air mass coming down south. It's kind of moderated the temperatures in that area. And then up in Canada, bear clinic system there moving out of Saskatchewan into Manitoba. And behind it, some cool blustery conditions. There's a look at the SPC overview map and you can see that, that they've got that slight risk there pretty much tailing that front and then cutting over to Kansas in the middle of that return flow and then we get up into the high plains and we've got that upslope and uh, dry line leading edge of the cold front activity. And most everything right now is severe thunderstorm watches. And this also illustrates that the activity across the southern U.S. is very disorganized. So based on that, we don't really have to look at too much. 
But one thing I do see in the northeast U.S. looks like some fast-moving storms there in northern Pennsylvania. So I'm going to circle back to the surface map. And those storms are going to be about right in there. And this looks to be behind the cold front. Looks like there's still residual moisture through this area. So the mean tropospheric flow probably mostly out of the west and northwest. And that's helping to carry a very strong forward movement on those cells. Now you know based on this I might even modify the analysis. I can see 88 there in Wilmington, 95 in Washington, D.C. Wow, sultry day. I guess with those protests going on in D.C., that heat is probably going to add to the tempers in that area. So let me see, where's that cold front? Yeah, you know, I might go with something like this. Kind of connect that back. And then the warm front. That's very tricky, but I see 88 there in Wilmington, dropping off to 77, then 79. So it's kind of the same air mass from Boston to New Jersey. And then it falls off rapidly. So maybe I'm going to go with something like that, perhaps. Okay, and then just finishing that off. Yeah, I think that's what we got going on there. Occluded front there in Quebec, and then we pick up that frontal system in Pennsylvania. Now you notice that the isobars don't really follow the fronts too much. That's because I've got the smoothing kind of cranked up, and I've got a very coarse analysis algorithm. Let me just show you real quick. Now we do draw these maps in digital atmosphere. And under the analysis tab, I've got this uh, analysis type. The past couple of days I've been using this nearest neighbors just so I can get the maps cranked out fast, but I do get much better results with Cressman. And I'll show you what I mean. This actually uses weighting and it looks at all the stations. It doesn't over smooth stuff. And let's see what kind of results we get. Yeah, that's the thing about analysis algorithms. A lot of people take them very literally. And when it doesn't identify a, a low, people get concerned and they think that the program is failing. When in fact, things are just oversmoothed. And a lot of work with getting a really good machine analysis is getting those numbers right and picking the right analysis method. Now you can see it's a little bit noisier. See all those highs and lows way out here? That's mathematical noise. So that's not really great either. But you do see definition out here in Montana where there's a low kind of in this area here. So let me fix it. I'm going to turn up the smoothing a little bit. Well, that's not great, but I'll go with that. And we'll add the fronts. I don't know, it's probably getting a little bit messy, so I'm probably going to have to experiment with that. But we'll take care of that. Let's look at the satellite data. Here's the picture in Texas a couple hours ago. You can see that sea breeze right there. And the anvil is kind of trailing backwards. Now let's run that forward. And you can see the whole thing moving north leading edge from about the Lufkin area all the way back to just southeast of Austin and it is propagating north. Now typically around 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. is when this stuff dies off and at the very latest it will hang around to 8 or 9. On rare, rare occasions on rare occasions it will make it up into the Dallas-Fort Worth area so depending on the pattern that's one of the things that you have to watch out for forecasting in that area. There's the picture out there in Texas, storms going up, and there is some shear on these things. Even out there in New Mexico, these storms are pretty well sheared. Now, I know we didn't see much SPC risk in that area, so there's obviously going to be a problem. And I would bet that's probably high LCLs, low boundary layer RH, and maybe limited instability.
That tends to be a common problem in the early summer. And wow, even one little cell there tried to initiate in the enid area. So that may be something to watch out for, but at the moment it kind of looks like a turkey tower there. Working our way up the plains, more thunderstorm activity. The stuff also looks moderately sheared, and the stuff is propagating to the east. And then up in South Dakota, where they have that slight risk. Yeah, actually slight risk all the way from I-70 northward. Yeah, those storms up there in South Dakota look uh, very well sheared. Very long anvils trailing off to the northeast. So, And looks like some higher base stuff out in the mountains of western Wyoming. So which storms are most favorable? I would probably look at the moisture. Let me draw the isodrosotherm. We'll do 60. Then we'll do 65. And then we'll do, I'm going to do 68 since there's not, not a lot of 70s. And then I'll go ahead and just throw in that 70. Your isoplething does not have to be even with the intervals. The pattern is more important. And what we see here is the moisture axis running from north of Wichita up towards the Russell area. So storms feeding off that moisture axis, those have the best potential. So storms in the I-70 area around Russell, let's take a look at that. Well, nothing in that area, so we're going to have to work further up that moisture axis. And that carries us into the McCook area. Some of the better parcels will be in that area. And the storms are trying to get going. That one died, a couple other good ones going. But one problem in that area is the unfavorable wind flow. That's going to shorten the hodographs and become a problem. And I don't see much help. I don't see much easterly flow there in Kansas. So working up the working up the Great Plains. Not much help. These winds are a little bit more organized, but they're not backed. A little bit of easterly flow right there, but that's back in the dry air. So nothing too great, although they're in the Enid area, 99 over 64, with a slightly backed wind. If that tower gets going, that could have some potential. And that's that thing right there, but so far that looks like one little turkey tower. And as you can see, my timeline is getting longer and longer, so we're going to need to wrap this up really fast. Otherwise, a lot of you are going to be waiting for the video, and I don't want that. So let's jump right to the forecast, and part of that is going to be checking on Cristobal. Yeah, there it is. Looks like it has gone inland. Died off to 45 knots, 995 millibars. Let's see if that's going to pull back out in the Gulf. NHC is bringing that into central Louisiana. And the GFS forecast, pretty much the same as yesterday, taking that right into the eastern half of Louisiana. So the main impacts will be... Looks like Lafayette to New Orleans, somewhere in that area. And then from our friends in Europe, the ECMWF. That model did really well last year. And it's going for a very slight westward jog there, more towards Lake Charles. But it's got the same idea, bringing the storm into Louisiana. And then just a quick check at th of the models for any big changes. Looks like we're dragging some cold air into the Central Plains right there, a little bit more into Oregon and Idaho. And you can see this high, 1026 millibar high, really building in there in the Great Lakes region. So that's going to bring some cool air that's going to try to force its way down to Oklahoma and Kansas, maybe northeast Texas, and it'll probably get wrapped into the back of this circulation on Cristobal. That's almost certainly what's happening there. Anyway, yeah, also looks like some good troughing on the west coast. See that right there? That's an upper level jet coming onshore. Where did that come from? That was almost out of nowhere. 
Yeah, there it is right there. I guess we got a pretty good digging trough right there in the western U.S. This is around Saturday to Sunday. So strong jet stream energy right in there and probably a surface front crossing the Sierra Nevada into Nevada and Utah. But I'm sure this time of year, the main punch of that is going to go up into the northern plains because that's just what tends to happen. And there it is. Yeah, a little bitty squall line there in the central plains and looks like a little bit of a weak high, 10, 12 millibars. Carries a weak westerly punch into Texas. Cristobal comes up the Mississippi River Valley Monday to Tuesday, so probably, if that holds, some flooding rains likely in that corridor, probably through there. After that, looks uh, dry. You can see a northerly flow, so some of that Pacific air oozing into Texas, and a little bit of a reinforcement there, 10, 10 20 millibar high. So that's a kind of a very weak taste of winter there. cool dry air coming into Texas. It will be heated up, you know, of course, but we're not going to have that awful sultry tropical air in the southern plains. Of course, that is going to put a damper on storm chasing, unfortunately. So let's see what happens. Uh, high starts moving out. We start establishing the southerly flow around the 12th. This is a big change from the models. I think they were going for kind of a central plain system, and I think they backed off on that. Anyway, yeah, let's... Wow, another big high coming down, 10, 30, okay. Hudson Bay Vortex is not done. More cold air coming south, and 540 decameter thickness in Michigan in June. Okay. Well, so be it. Another Pacific system coming inland. So more unsettled weather for the northern plains there. Looks like that crosses over into Illinois next week. And we get to the end of the run. So that's the quick high-speed look at the forecast. And now it's time to get this wrapped up and edited. And I think that's all I got for tonight. The weekend is starting to approach here. And... I don't know if uh, Cristobal is going to warrant any special coverage. Typically, landfalling tropical storms, especially in Louisiana, are not really all that impressive. So I think based on this, we're going to give the patron donors a special video Sunday or Monday, maybe both days. And then we'll be back as usual on Tuesday. I don't think this is going to warrant a live stream. That would need to be a landfalling hurricane or a moderate to high risk day with tornadoes. And I don't see anything like that soon. But we will try to do that someday soon, a live stream, once the weather cooperates. Okay, that's it for today. Have a good evening, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.